Hi, Fred. My name is Josh Shell, host of the Let's Start a Cult podcast, the only podcast host addicted to Kool-Aid. I prefer the fruit punch. I find the grape flavor has a deadly aftertaste. Anyways, with all that out of the way, let me introduce to you my lovely guest today. She is one of the hosts of the Ye Old Crime podcast, the podcast that discusses strange and spooky stories from the past. From unicorn horns to the devil, these girls cover it all. Please welcome to the Covenant, Lindsay Valenti. Lindsay, how are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Awesome. It's great to have you. So in today's episode of the Let's Start a Cult, we will be discussing the story of Colonia Dignitad, a religious commune established on the foothills of the Chile's Andes Mountains. To outsiders, it seems like a self-sustaining Christian community that strived to give back to the locals. However, it would later be revealed that it had ties to both Nazi Germany and the Pinochet government, which killed over 3,000 people, while a thousand more remain missing to this day. Now, Lindsay, you actually brought this cult to my attention a few weeks ago. Where did you first hear about it and what caught your interest about it? I think it was something where I went on Wikipedia, I think, and just (laughs) randomly was looking up cults. I don't know why. That's just kind of the weird kind of stuff I do. And Just in your free time? Just in my free time. I'm just like, (laughs) what's some random weird cults I can look at today? So I Googled that (laughs) and and this one came up and I was like, oh my God, this one has it all. (laughs) It's like Nazis, Chile, (laughs) cults. Child abuse. Child abuse. Everything you need. It's got all the heavy hitters. (laughs) I was like, I need to let Josh know about this. Yeah, well, and I appreciate you bringing it to my attention because it definitely is a very, very weird cult for sure. And I think it's it's pretty well known. I had heard a lot of Nazis had gone to uh, South America and built communities down there. I didn't know to what degree, and this definitely opened my eyes to it. Oh, yes. Quite a few of them. I actually have a, a distant relative who also did the same thing. So, unfortunately. Oh, Interesting. Yeah. I might have to ask you about that story after afterwards. <laughs> yeah, you totally can, yes. <laughs> well, all right. Well, without further ado, let us jump into the Colonia Dignitad. Paul Schaefer was born on December 4th, 1921, in the town of Trostdorf in Germany. As a child, he suffered from an accident that left him blind, and he was forced to make do with a glass right eye. Although he would later pass it off as a wartime injury... <laughs> Which sounds way cooler than maybe getting poked with a stick. I just want to know what kind of accident. Like, did he fall on his head? Was he hit in the back of the head by a bat? (laughs) The bat. Yeah, yeah. He was playing baseball and just took a a baseball to the eye or something (laughs) like that. (laughs) During World War II, he served under the Nazi regime as a medic and an officer with the Luftwaffe uh, or German Air Force. Luftwaffe. Thank you. Yeah, I don't. I don't know why I would have that knowledge. <laughs> yes, you seem to know a lot about the Nazis. <laughs> I swear I'm not a Nazi. Okay. Okay. Whew. All right. When Germany fell to the Allied powers, Schaefer decided to hide his Nazi ties and reinvented himself as an evangelical preacher. In particular, he was a fan of the American preacher William M. Bronham, who was also said to have a huge influence on Jim Jones, the leader of the infamous People's Temple cult. So, good tie into our first episode. Dun, dun, dun. Yep. <laughs> As an evangelical preacher, Schaefer promoted Bronham's teaching in West Germany and garnered a sizable following of impoverished war widows and their children, many of whom were refugees from East Prussia, which was occupied by the Soviet Union. He also found work as a youth leader in several church institutions. And Lindsay, what is the stigma around men who work with youth in the church? They tend to touch them. And that's not yeah. good. Yeah, that's <laughs> right on the money. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and not in the fun way. <laughs> no, no, not as in like picking them up and throwing them or what. I don't know how you play with kids. I have no idea. <laughs> <But> <laughs> Hitting them in the back of the head with a baseball bat. You know, the yeah, usual the, stuff. <laughs> the usual tomfoolery. <laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> Schaefer's tomfoolery was definitely illegal, and he was fired from all of the churches he worked at due to allegations that he was molesting underage boys. And then he decided to to try to open up his own orphanage. However, and luckily, this venture failed when he was once again accused of sexually abusing minors. So he seems like a great, great guy so far. 
He's just an entrepreneur. He's just trying to do his thing. <laughs> just, spread, just doing his darndest out there the in the world, you know? <laughs> One touch at a time. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> To avoid being arrested by authorities, Schaefer, accompanied by a few of his followers, fled West Germany in 1961 and sought refuge in the Middle East. There, he was introduced to a prominent Chilean ambassador who invited him to live in Chile. At the time, Chile was under President George Alexandria, whose administration granted Schaefer a farm located a few kilometers outside the city of Perel and Chile's linear province. Linearies? Linearies. Province, sure. <laughs> we'll go with it. With the government's help, he bought a 4,400-acre ranch located at the foothills of the Andy Mountains and established a religious commune called Colina Dignitad, which translates to Dignity Colin. And we will soon see that it was anything but dignity. <laughs> it sounds, sounds like it's going to be on the up and up. Yes, that's one way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> Founded on William M. Braunham's teaching, Colonia Dignitad espoused principles like anti-communism and strict adherence to the Bible. Given Schaefer's past as a member of the Hitler Youth and an officer of the Lut oh God, Luftwaffe. Luftwaffe? You got this one again. Luftwaffe. Thank you. <laughs> I'll ask Luftwaffe. for your help every, every time on that one. <laughs> right. His religious commune was also heavily influenced by Nazism, of course. Colonia Dignitad began what? with... What? Yeah, surprise, the Nazi has Nazi influences. <laughs> Colonia Dignitad began with 10 of Schaefer's original followers, but as the years passed, its members swelled. This was fueled by waves of immigrants from Germany who were enticed by the commune's way of living, which involved sustainable agriculture practices and numerous charity works for the local population. However, what they found upon arriving in Chile was something else entirely. It always starts with the best of intentions. Like, oh, look at this. We're such good farmers. We give back to the locals. We're all smiling, I would say, happy people. <laughs> I would say most usually do. This one, he was like, I touch kids and now I need to escape Germany. <laughs> <laughs> but also Nazism? Yes. I also want to espouse the Bible and Nazism. Two things that definitely go hand in hand. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. We are now going to dive into a bit of the life in, in the cult itself. So among the immigrants who came to the Colonia Dignitad, hoping for a better life, was Helmut Schaefrich and his wife Emmy, who sold their house in northern Germany and flew to Chile with their entire life savings. Schaefer asked them to hand over all their money, which was the equivalent to 22500 in terms of today's dollars, which isn't a crazy amount, but I guess oh war-torn God. Germany is like, you're not saving a lot there. <laughs> no. So yeah, they must have been saving that for a long time before then. Because mm, that's, yeah. that's crazy. The couple was told that their stay was only temporary and that they were free to leave at any time they wanted. According to their son Horst, though, quote, they were tricked. They thought they would build a place where they would do good works and live like good Christians. They found nothing but slavery and suffering, end quote. So very dark. That's also such a cliche. You can mm. leave anytime you want. Yeah, we took all your money in your possessions. Me all your money. Yeah, <laughs> but you're free to go whenever. Yeah, classic. <laughs> like the other members of Colonial Dignitad, Hem Helmet and Emmy were forced to endure 16 hour long work days in brutal conditions, pausing for only a few minutes to eat lunch. Their exhaustion was ignored by Schaefer, who preached Jesus. Arbit East Goten's. <laughs> or work is divine service to instill in them the belief that their labor was for a higher cause uh so work will set you free i think is just it's just rebranded right yeah pretty much yeah this is yeah. this is my take my twist i'm new hitler <laughs> it's like new coke but worse yep. it's not copyright if i change it around a little bit <laughs> However, this backbreaking work resulted in tons of crops, which allowed the commune to flourish. Its members, who were referred to as colonos, managed to construct mills, craft shops, hen houses, stables, and a kitchen. There was even a hospital that had been established with the help of the subsidies granted by President Alessandra and his administration. A two-story building with 65 beds, a maternity ward, and sterile operating rooms, the Colony Colonia Dignitad Hospital was a modern marvel known for its excellent quality of care. Its patients consisted mostly of locals who were taken there by buses hired by the colonos. 
I just think it's fascinating that like the hospital would be so nice. For some reason, that just sounds really, really creepy to me. I don't know why, <laughs> but... It's uh, kind of a kick in the butt as an American, eh? You're like, even they get free health care? They're slaves. <laughs> oh, my God. They get free health care. <laughs> and uh, I'm over here with a, st- with a stump. <laughs> I have to wait for five days to get it sewn up. Jesus. <laughs> In particular, the hospital's maternity ward was popular among the surrounding villages, mainly because of its policy of supplying mothers with four and a half pounds of powdered milk every month for the first six years of their child's life. For the locals, this gift was practically heaven sent. Now, I actually learned recently in an episode of Behind the Bastards, I'm not sure if anyone listens to it, but Nestle used to do this practice where they would give young mothers milk for free, but just to get them hooked on it so that they would keep using it and then these poor villages didn't have the proper like sanitary ways to make healthy powdered milk. And so their children would get very sick and caused millions of children to die around the world. So I'm not sure what, what this is, but uh, oh it could, my God. could be part of it. Go, go listen to Jesus. behind the bastards Nestle episode. It's, it's good. It, it talks about all of that. Jesus. And we thought uh, the whole Flint, Michigan crisis was bad. Fuck. Well, that is bad, (laughs) but uh, it's a different kind of bad. (laughs) Yeah. Colonia Dignitad may have seemed like a paradise for those who didn't live in it, but for its colonos, it was nothing but a living hell. Besides forced labor and working them to exhaustion, Schaefer also used a complex system of social controls to ensure their total obedience. For instance, he encouraged the colonos to think of themselves as an extended family, one whose relationship was based not on blood, but rather on their devotion to him. Each member was required to call Schaefer the permanent uncle, which was a name he'd chosen for himself. And I'll give him props because it is better than most of the nicknames I have heard from these cult leaders. It's usually like just like an offset of God or Jesus or the father. Like he went uncle. I, I appreciate that. Oh, the permanent <laughs> uncle. That just sounds even creepier. That's true. It, yeah. Because there's the God. whole stigma of just call uncles Just call molesting. him molester Lester. Like, let's just call him that. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) According to the American scholar, quote, Schaefer offered his flock to possibilities of pure existence in the service of God. All that was required was the regular confession of sin. His followers proved eager to unload their guilt and their confessions, personally received by Schaefer in a practice he called Silasorge, or care of the soul, became the vehicle for their salvation, end quote. So the seal of swords took place each day with Schaefer summoning the colonos in small groups to discuss their sins. He made the practice seem like their only chance at salvation. However, it actually served to put them under his thumb even more. By telling him their deepest, darkest secrets, the members of the Colonia Dignitad gave their leader more control of their lives. And a lot of cults do this where they have the open uh, group desinification where you confess your stuff and then everybody knows about it. So then they can use it to manipulate you more. It's uh, straight from the playbook of Jim Jones or any of those other ones. Yeah. He's such a, but he's such a great uncle. Yeah. A great uncle wouldn't do that. <laughs> he wouldn't. He wouldn't molest children. Not Uncle Lester. <laughs> no. Um, <laughs> like most other cults, Kalana Dignitad destroyed familial relationships to ensure that each member was loyal only to Schaefer. For instance, couples were required to live apart, and any baby born in the communion spent the first few years living with nurses in the hospital. That's so messed up. Oh yeah, yeah, it's definitely messed up. To divide families even more, Schaefer classified the colonos into several different levels. The babies referred to the newborns and toddlers still living in the hospital, while children aged 6 to 14 were called the wedges. <laughs> Which is, I don't know why I find that funny. The wedges is just <laughs> hilarious. <laughs> it just makes me think of those like 70s style wedge shoes. Oh, I was, even th- I was just thinking like potato wedges. <laughs> oh, I like yours better. <laughs> <laughs> it's sounds... just a bunch of potato wedges. <laughs> just, just snacking. They're, they're, oh, they are his snack, which is dark. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Leave the wedges alone. Back off the wedges, Uncle Lester. (laughs) Upon reaching the age of 16, they graduated into the Army of Salvation, where they would stay until their mid-30s. They would then be included in a group called the Elder Servants, remaining there until their 50s, upon which they were invited to join the Comalos, 
These levels were reserved for male members, although females also progressed through similar tiers called the dragons, the field mice, the women's group, and the grannies, which up until the grannies is like, oh those are good God. names. <laughs> what were the dragons? Were they the wedges? Those must have been the wedges, right? You would think those, because I could see the field mice being the people that are in the serving in some sort of military capacity, like maybe like the nurses or something. Mm, that makes sense. So was it an actual army? No. Uh, well, they had oh like, my God. We, we talk about that a little bit more, but they do have like armed people in the commune. We'll, we'll talk about it a little bit in the, in the, in the future. Okay. Um, sorry. I'm skipping ahead. I'm sorry. That's, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> One more thing. So I love how they're called elder servants when they're in their mid thirties. <laughs> like, yeah, is that when not, you get your AARP card? I was You're say, now an elder servant. As a twenty-seven-year-old, that's not looking great for me. I'm going to be elderly soon. <laughs> Jesus, no, I I would be considered an elder servant right now. So, <laughs> oh, you're you're almost in the comalos. You're killing it. <laughs> oh yeah. I have one foot in the Kamalos. <laughs> it's your bad foot. <laughs> it's the one that's arthritic. It's yeah, bad. It's, it's closest to being there. <laughs> Besides removing familial ties, Schaefer also exerted control upon the Kalanos by stripping them of their individuality. The only personal possessions allowed to them were their pajamas, a set of work clothes, a set of leisure clothes, and a week's supply of underwear. Everything else they supposedly owned, including their <laughs> shoes, was locked in a closet, which they f couldn't freely access. So that's not nice. I love how they have to specify that they have a week's worth of underwear. I mean, that's pretty good. I don't know if I have seven days worth and of that. I have to do laundry Yeah. every six days. And I'm also like, leisure clothes. I immediately, when I hear leisure clothes, go to like Heaven's Gate, where they're wearing Ooh. like the, the track suits. Yeah. And that's yeah. like their leisure clothes. <laughs> yeah, the... The basketball team or whatever it was. I also, I don't know when they had leisure because they were working 16-hour days. Like, I can't imagine there's n much leisure time. Exactly. Yeah. I'm just picturing it, like, hanging on a hook in their room as, like, like mocking them. Like, oh, here's your leisure clothes. <laughs> you can never wear them. Yeah, you can wear them for five minutes before you get into your pajamas before every day. <laughs> <laughs> Despite these hardships, the majority of the colonists were totally devoted to Schaefer, who was said to be a gifted and charismatic orator. They followed his every whim, even when he forbade them from engaging in private conversations with each other, and from leaving the commune's property. Anyone caught violating these rules was humiliated and severely punished. While colonial dignitad consisted of both males and females, women were largely treated as second-class citizens, whose sexuality could drive men wild and force them to stray from God. Because of this, they were required to roll up their hair into tight buns and wear baggy dresses that hide their bodies. You know, basically what Texas is right now. Yeah, no shit. Yeah. yeah. Let's just just saran wrap it all up so you just look like a board. Yeah. And we can't control ourselves, so we'll control you. Yeah. It's your fault. It's your yes. fault that my penis gets hard. <laughs> you need to, to hide that. Hide your shame. Make yourself look as unattractive as possible. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that I feel better about myself. My definitely not insecure masculinity. <laughs> help me not want you. <laughs> <laughs> help me help not want you. That's my slogan to run this cult. <laughs> Vote for me. <laughs> Uncle Lester. <laughs> Uncle Lester. <laughs> Hope you like bags. Because you're going to dress like one. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> oh God. For Schaefer, making the women appear as unattractive as possible was the best way to ensure that the colonists wouldn't engage in sexual intercourse, which he considered the devil's tool. This was also the reason for the backbreaking work that they were made to do. By exhausting them in the workshops or the fields, Schaefer hoped that their libidos would become so frustrated that it would kill their desire to have sex. <laughs> so <laughs> clearly they had kids, so I don't I think that backfired on them. Oh my God. Ah. Oh. That is hysterical. But if you think about it, like, if he makes them so unattractive, it makes it so you can't tell that they have breasts and they're, like, severe features. Isn't he making them look like his ideal, like, target audience, if you will? Oh, like children? <laughs> like children? Oh, God. <laughs> 
they might not find you attractive, but I think you're beautiful. <laughs> I love you the way you are in your bagged clothing. Your bun uh, is fetching today. <laughs> I just I want I don't want to be able to tell whether you're man or woman, and then we'll, we'll uh, go from there. <laughs> you're just an amorphous blob at this point, and that's how I want it. Um, <laughs> despite these measures, some colonists still managed to fall in love and develop r- romantic relationships with each other. However, they were still subjected to Schaefer's whims. There were times which he permitted couples to marry and have children, but more than often not, he forbade them from doing so. According to the American scholar, quote, When a man asked Schaefer for the permission to marry, he entered into a game of sexual roulette. Schaefer might grant them a request, but then require that he be the one to select the bride. This seldom worked in the man's favor, for the women Schaefer chose were almost always well beyond childbearing years. End quote. Just picture him pulling a curtain and it's all the grannies. (laughs) It's like, you get number five. This is Mildred. She's been wearing a bag for 30 years. She remembers World War I. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, God. The colonists may have been forced to endure these strange and humiliating conditions, but many of them chose to willingly remain in Colonia Dignitad. Perceiving it as a utopia amid a world overcome by war, famine, death, and communism. They were particularly fearful of the latter, mainly because of the horrific stories they had heard about what Soviet soldiers did to civilians during the final days of World War II when they swept through eastern Germany to reach Berlin. Which is hilarious to me because it's like, you were Germans, Nazis, most of you. Do you not understand what you did? (laughs) Like, you did worse, I think, in many regards. Exactly. I'm pretty sure they took a page out of your playbook, not necessarily the other way around. I think they were bad. Both of them were bad, but I don't know why they would. I guess they weren't on the bad end of the German side, so they didn't really see that probably. Or, well, they. I don't know. I have no idea. It's dumb. It's a dumb fear, and they are dumb people. I'll say it. (laughs) (laughs) It's all dumb. They're just a bunch of dummies. Yeah. Uh, fearful of communist takeover of the world, Schaefer and his followers established a parliamentary unit to defend Colonia Dignitad. The men who were chosen to be part of it were trained in military tactics and martial arts. They referred to Schaefer as a general and were required to carry a sidearm at all times. So here's your army, <laughs> Lindsay. Do they call him Uncle General or just General? <laughs> general Uncle Permanent Uster General, actually. <laughs> <laughs> The long Lester name. Lester General. <laughs> since, since the commune had no enemies, though, this parliamentary unit was used instead of to punish sinners, starving and beating them, as well as threatening them with rabid dogs. They did this to the members that Schaefer didn't like, whom they and the rest of the colonists re- referred to as the rebels. One of these rebels was a Chilean man named Franz Barr, who was 10 when he was adopted by a German couple. For no reason at all, Schaefer singled him out as a troublemaker, and his members of the parliamentary unit beat him with electrical cables, which resulted in his skull breaking and him losing consciousness. Afterwards... Oh my god! Yeah, yeah, not even... We're not even done yet. Afterwards, Barr was taken to Colonia Dignitad Hospital and imprisoned in an upstairs section, where he remained for 31 years. 31 years! (laughs) So he was... Oh my god... At the hospital, Barr and others, who were also identified as rebels, were forcibly medicated, which made their movements clumsy and slow. Because of this, they sustained horrific injuries during their work hours since they were required to handle heavy machinery. They were subjugated to shock treatment as well, with a female physician increasing the voltage every time they answered a question incorrectly. Okay, that's a lot. But also, I'm impressed they had female physicians. (laughs) You're like... But, you know, progress. Pro- so progress. I'm just like, wow. Why to be so forward thinking, Uncle Lester? Jeez. Yeah. But, yeah, that's awful. Yeah. Yeah. Not It's not a good thing. But uh, one of the rebels, a man named Wolfgang Mueller, repeatedly tried to escape from Colonia Dignitad. His first two attempts ended in failure, and he was brought back to the commune by a parliamentary unit who beat and forcibly sedated him. Mueller managed to successfully escape in 1966, making it to Chile's capital of Santiago, where he was taken to a safe house owned by a German embassy. When Schaefer heard about this, he sent 15 colonists to storm the place to recapture Mueller. However, they were outnumbered by police officers and were forced to return to the commune empty-handed. 
Soon afterwards, Mueller was taken back to Germany, where he went public with what was happening in Colonia Dignitad. Unfortunately for him, the authorities ignored his accusations. But, Ugh. Lindsay, do you know who won't capture and sedate you and force you to be a slave for years? Someone who's not Uncle Lester? Yeah, I mean, probably a lot of people, but especially the, the products and services that support this podcast. They will definitely not do that. <laughs> <laughs> I can almost guarantee it. Fingers crossed. Today's episode of Let's Start a Cult is brought to you by DB. DB is a Scandinavian brand that makes backpacks and bags to help people on the move stay ready for anything. From the streets to the peaks, DB's gear is travel tested by some of the world's best athletes, adventurers, and creators. Over the past decade, DB has designed and developed, released, and redefined the best bags in the market. With DB's patented hookup system, you are able to attach smaller products to your backpack, roller, or tote. When I'm traveling town to town to give my new age sermons, I always need a good bag to hold my books in to make sure the right message is spread so I know how important luggage is to traveling. Let's Start a Cult is teaming up with DB to exclusively offer our listeners 10% off your next purchase by using the code POD10 or going to the link in our show notes. DB, it's time to move on, time to get going. And we are back. See, that wasn't so bad. That was better than 31 years in a prison in a medical facility, wasn't it? So much better. I mean, my <laughs> head doesn't hurt. Yeah, true. You don't have a fractured skull. I don't have a fractured skull. I haven't had a bunch of voltage sent through my body. So I'm feeling pretty good. Which I would rather that. It's a Friday night. Put some volts through me. Come on. I'm learning so much about you. So is my audience. <laughs> <laughs> Um, given Schaefer's past, Colonia Dignitad was used as a refuge by former Nazis who were being hunted down by international governments and organizations. This wasn't the worst thing that the commune was involved in, though. On September 11th, 1973, never forget, Chile was seized by Augusto Pinochet. Never forget. <laughs> who led a right-wing militia junta in a bloody coup against the socialist government of then-president Salvador Allenden. To eliminate his opponents, Pinochet established the National Intelligence Directory, or DINA, which was a secret police force responsible for identifying enemies of his regime. Those arrested were taken to torture and execution centers located across Chile, one of them which was Colonia Dignitad. So he teamed up with the fascist leaders, which makes sense. Wow. Record scratch. <laughs> Who would have guessed it? Not me. Many of the prisoners never <laughs> came out of the commune. Later, a former Dina officer named Michael Townley alleged that Colonia Dignitad had also been equipped with a secret laboratory where government scientists worked day and night to develop chemical weapons. Among the people imprisoned in Colonia Dignitad was Louis Pebbles, who commanded a secret anti-Pinochet militia. Unfortunately, he, he was arrested by Dina in February 1975 and taken to the religious commune, where he was subjected to shock therapy that lasted for six hours or more. Ah, Jesus Christ. That's my kind of Friday night. When not being tortured, he was kept in a dirty cell, blindfolded, strapped to a metal grate, and denied both food and water. So, classic torture. Sounds like a delightful <laughs> b and Yeah, you know, he was at least fed. Oh no, he wasn't fed. Never mind. <laughs> I take that back. I immediately just read that and forgot about it. <laughs> um, JK. Just kidding. Take that back. Colonia <laughs> Dignitad's ties to Pinochet remained a secret for years. That is until 1977 when Amnesty International published a 60-page report titled Colonia Dignitad, a German community in Chile, a torture camp for the Dina. It consisted of witness accounts from tortured survivors, including Pebbles, who fled to Europe after his release from the commune. Unfortunately, Schaefer's lawyers filed libel charges against Amnesty International, which prevented the human rights organization from distributing its reports until 1997. It's so almost 20 years later. God. Yeah, that's Jeez. crazy. The law sucks. That's my stance. That's a hard stance. <laughs> Screw the law. I am the law. <laughs> oh, no, I'm turning to Uncle Lester. <laughs> 
However, this legal battle didn't stop Pebbles and other torture survivors from speaking out against Colonia Dignitad. It didn't take long before documentary filmmakers and reporters started paying attention to them. In March 1990, the Pinochet regime collapsed and was replaced by a government headed by the former senator named Patricio Alwin, 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 who was one of Schaefer's most outspoken critics. Not only did he in- initiate a financial audit of the commune, but he also removed the state funding for its hospital and revoked its status as a nonprofit charitable organization. Infuriated, the Colonius staged protests and hunger strikes, but these amounted to nothing. Yeah, why would he? Why would he care? <laughs> yeah, he's like, okay, starve yourself. That fixes a lot of my problems. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> When allegations surfaced that Schaefer was sexually abusing children, the authorities conducted several raids on Colonia Dignitad, hoping to catch him. However, they never managed to do so, which led to speculations that he had left the commune and Chile. Schaefer did abandon Colonia Dignitad sometime in the 1990s, although the colonists continued to live by the rules that he had introduced and strictly enforced. They did begin to cooperate with authorities, though, and in July 2005, Schaefer's stockpile of weapons was unearthed. It included 92 machine guns, 176 kilograms of TNT, and more than a thousand hand grenades, among other things. All of these were illegal. (laughs) Oh my Uh, god. I love that it's like a normal amount of guns and like just so many hand grenades. (laughs) Like why so many hand grenades? I know, that's what I was thinking too. I was like, that's less machine guns than I was anticipating. But then it's like, but there's more than a thousand hand grenades. Yeah, we have more hand grenades than we have bullets. Or people for that matter. Or people, yeah, exactly. Oh, God. A few months before this discovery, though, on March 10th, 2005, Schaefer was found hiding in an exclusive gated community called Las Asiasis. God damn. Yeah, we'll go with that. <laughs> I don't care enough to try and pronounce it. Which was located just outside the Buenos Aires, Argentina. He was swiftly extradited back to Chile and charged with being involved in the disappearance of Juan Meno, a prominent political uh, activist who had vanished without a trace in 1976. The discovery of his illegal stash oh, of wow. weapons sealed the deal, and the following year, on May 24, 2006, Schaefer was sentenced to 20 years in prison for sexually abusing a total of 25 children. He was also ordered to pay the equivalent of $1.5 million to minors who had filed lawsuits against him. Good. (laughs) Yeah. That's a lot of money. They deserved it. Those kids, not him. Well, he deserved it too, I guess. Yeah. Losing the money. I'm now confused is what I'm saying. The kids deserved the money. He did not deserve the money. (laughs) That's what I'll recap that with. And he deserved to go to prison and pay the money. Yes, he deserved all of that, and more, probably. Overall, Schaefer was convicted of 20 counts of dishonest abuse and 5 counts of child rape, all of which he committed between 1993 and 97. However, he was never punished for the tortures that he inflicted on the members of Colonia Dignitad. On April 24, 2010, 88-year-old Paul Schaefer died of heart failure at the San Diego, Chile's ex-penitentiary's hospital. Nine years later, in 2019, it was reported that the people he victimized as leader of Colonia Dignitad would receive a compensation of up to $11,000 from the German government, which seems low. Seems low to me, since two of them paid $22,000. So they just got their money back with no interest 50 years later, or whatever it was. Exactly. Oh, you know what? They probably weren't still alive. You're right, actually, now that I think about it. They got there. Yeah, they're probably dead. That's a good point. They would have been dead. (laughs) But their child, uh, whatever his name, Horace, he might be alive still. So he gets his parents' money back. Yeah, he probably could have gotten it. Yeah, yeah. To distance himself from Schaefer's ties to Nazism and the Pinochet government, the remaining members of the Colonia Dignitad changed the commune's name to Villa Bavaria in 1991. It has since become one of the top tourist destinations in Chile. With a German-themed restaurant and hotel, hundreds of former colonists still live there, claiming that it is the only home that they've ever known. Throughout the years, many investigation committees have been established to figure out what exactly went down in Colonia Dignitad. Despite their best efforts, though, many questions about the cult has remained unanswered. And that is the story of Colonia Dignitad, the Nazi cult. Yeah. so messed up. It is very messed up. And the fact that they're just like, hey, now we're just a cute little cutesy place in Chile <laughs> that you can come visit with our German-themed restaurant and hotel. 
I'll be fair to these, the people there now, they were probably the ones being abused. So they uh, probably just stayed there and then they don't really know much else, right? They don't, they didn't learn any practical skills that could help them in the real world. So they just stayed and I suppose. farmed. Yeah. 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 Cause I'm sure a lot of them were born there. Yeah. Well, a lot of them were born there and then tortured there. So good, good memories. They can't leave that place for sure. <laughs> so many good memories. Remember that time What's His Face was beaten with a cable? Yeah. Oh, Old, uh, that was a good day. Yeah. Remember when we were all high and sedated and prison, <laughs> prisoners of the hospital that's no longer there? Loved it. Yeah. Um, now, Lindsay, before we end off the show, we do have to do my favorite segment. At the end of each cult, we do cult critiques. So my guest and I take a look at the cult we just discussed, and we give it a rating out of five stars, as if you were rating something on Yelp. We give comments to go with those okay. stars because I realize the stars are kind of arbitrary, so they're whatever you want them to be. So are you ready <laughs> to <laughs> are you ready to rate this cult? Well, I gotta say, I think I'm gonna give it I'll give it three stars. Just because there should have been less Nazism, probably less beatings. They could have yeah. done better with their military if they were a real cult, honestly. <laughs> Had more guns instead of hand grenades. Yeah, yeah. Although I'm debating whether I'm more afraid of the the amount of hand grenades they had or if they had more guns. Would I be more afraid of which? And I think I think the hand grenades scare me just because it's so confusing. It is. It just reminds me of what is it, Anchorman? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah it's like i have a grenade <laughs> like where did that come from is that brick brick has it right <laughs> just holding a grenade <laughs> brick has the grenade oh god and I then he gets a trident movie. out of nowhere too <laughs> that's a great movie and he's the most terrifying person in that <laughs> i'd be terrified if i was there oh my god i'd be so terrified of brick so Lindsay, three stars i think i would have to go with four stars i oh. think this checks a lot of the boxes of a cult. It has the blind obedience, the compound, the it's even got a military, which not many cults do. Yeah, I think if it wasn't for the child abuse, uh, I'd feel more comfortable giving it more stars, but four stars for being a solid cult all around, minus one star for being garbage people. <laughs> that's that's what I'll go with. Yeah, they are self-sustaining because they, they were farming and stuff. And a lot of the best communes are self-sustaining. Yeah. Because then it, it isolates them from others. Exactly. And when you're in a country where you don't speak the, the native language, it makes it even harder to venture from the commune. Oh, and you don't have shoes, so you can't even run away. In the, That's right. Yeah. Makes and it you difficult. you wouldn't want to run away from your lovely wife with her lazy eye and her <laughs> and her br uh, breasted hip hips. <laughs> well, I, uh, Lindsay, I, I appreciate you coming on and talking about Colonia Dignitat. I appreciate you bringing this to my attention and thank you everyone for listening. Yeah. But Lindsay, if you wouldn't mind, please let my listeners know where they can find your podcast. Sure. I'd be happy to. You can find us online at yieldcrimepodcast.com. We're on Twitter at yieldcrimepod on instagram at yield crime podcast we're on pretty much all of the podcast players out there probably wherever you listen to this podcast you can find us as well that's probably true yeah actually and we're constantly battling for the top spot in good pods <laughs> and, we uh, are. <laughs> uh thank you fred for listening and thank you Lindsay, for coming on definitely go listen to yield crime it's uh, they have great stories there and it is probably one of the most fun podcast names to say. Ye old crime. You always like yeehaw. It's kind of like ye old. You got to do the the arm pump when you say it. That's that's how yeah. I feel every time ye I say old it. Crime. <laughs> ye old crime. <laughs> so if you just go listen to it for that purpose only, I, I I'll be happy. So so definitely go check her out. They are great and. <laughs> They have tons of content that you guys can go listen to. If you love my podcast, you will definitely love Lindsay's podcast. So go check out Yield Crime. And thank you, Lindsay, thank you. again for coming on. We will see everyone next time. Bye.